we we were learning uh, Beta Bechira, I think during the winter. Sometime, sometime during Corona where they're not here, but they were put on YouTube. We did those Shurim and Zoom. And I think it was done Motzi Shabbos, basically. It was the winter, it was the winter series. And uh, we did the, the second paragraph of Beta Bechira, which you guys have in front of you. Uh, it's, it's the first section. And it talks about the Makom Uzbeach. And Rambam basically gives a tradition of Chazal says uh, the Mizbeach has to be a very specific place in the base of Mikdash, correct? He says, Makum Mechuvan Bioter. And it says, Masorath Biyad HaKol, Sh'ha Makum Sh'bana Bo David Shlomo HaMizbeach Begoron HaRavna, Hu HaMakum Sh'ba Sh'bana Bo Avraham Avinu HaMizbeach Ve'akad Alav Yitzchak. That place where David eventually built the altar, and that's the same place where Abraham built his altar for the binding of Isaac. Hold on one second. The, the, tuvat, the viewers, I guess I should put this on the screen. So that's an amazing thing. We have a tradition that that's where it was supposed to be. Mishnah Torah. Hold on one second, please. As usual, I thank you for your patience. How are the chips? We want to open up another bag. We want to re-up the hummus. Start a different salad. We could go. For, we could also go for matbucha next. You guys are making me hungry here. Okay. Uh, it says Hilchos Beis Bechira. We're in the second pack over here. Put it on the screen. Mm. More uh, security share screen. Okay, it should be visible there. So he says over here, that's where it was. Okay, even earlier, that's where Noah had built his altar when he left the ark. It's the same place where Kain and Hevel offered their their sacrifice. By the way, there is the Rambam showing you that Kain and Hevel used the same altar. So they, they he brought fruit. I guess you don't really bring fruit on the altar. That was like the first lesson. You know, God wants the fat, the fat sheep, not the fruit. So we don't put honey. Honey means like, you know, the stuff instead of fruit. Adam, when he was created, brought a korban. And there he was created. He was created, created from that very place. He was actually created from the place of his kapara. So the question was, what's the connection? Why does he have to be built from the place of his kapara? Why not from the Kodesh Kodeshim? Why not from, I don't know, some other place, Maras uh, Machpela, something else, where he was eventually buried, by the way. What? Okay, please. Um, how is it not Noach's altar was here and not right there? Well, he he walked. You know? Okay, where he took he, he took he, he had look the only horses in the world were his, so he got on a horse and you know it doesn't say like right away. By the way, you know obviously you know the things happened. You know Noah after the flood. It says how long did Noah live after the flood? Three hundred and fifty years. Okay. 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 So. Uh, it, it, it turns out here that the question was, what's the connection? Why is he Dafka buried in the place? Why was he why was he created there? God created him from, uh, so to speak, from dirt. And it says that God created him there. So uh, the connection, I believe, is this. Kapara and burial. There's a sugya there in Sanhedrin, which talks about the, the death penalty. There are people in this Kalina and this Rafim. The people, the worst sinners, they get, you know, they get stoned to death or they are burned actually get pushed off a you know high place but but they call it stoning so that says there basically the question is what's the point of burial and eventually the conclusion of the Gemara Mem Zion is that burial achieves a kapara for everybody there's no such thing in Judaism as disposing a class for shalom of a person's body even let's say a wicked gentile who's put to death for sins okay there's no such thing as let's say cremation or burial at sea or anything else like that Everybody has to be buried in the ground. It's a mitzvah because everybody's selling elokim. But there's also a kapara involved. That is the ultimate kapara. And therefore, it's kind of interesting. They're telling you here, so man is returned to the ground. Man has to. Man comes from the ground. You're basically made of dirt. I've seen this. Human beings, when they die, they turn back into dirt. That's why we bury them. So they have to be put back in the ground. Really, Adam should have been buried eventually where his ultimate kapara would be what? Burial back in the ground. And ideally, right at the very place where he was buried, where he was created. That would be the place in Mizbeach. However, God gave us a gift. You mentioned this gift in Vayikra. 
you bring a korban, you put the blood and the fat of the korban on the altar, the priests eat the meat, and what happens? It achieves kapara. Even the korban of Yom Kippur is eventually eaten. Kohanim don't eat on Yom Kippur, it's eaten after Yom Kippur apparently. So God has given man a gift, and what is that gift? The ability to achieve atonement for his sins while he is yet alive. The atonement of burial can only be achieved, what? Through death. He needs to die. And this is an amazing thing, an idea on Yom Kippur, is that man has a chance, even before he dies, to achieve complete atonement. That way he won't have to be buried. So the altar stands over this place where he should be buried, where he, from which he was created. And instead of man dying, he brings the animal, he, he confesses his sin, he resolves never to sin again, and he is absolved of his sin. That is an amazing thing. And that is what is ex explicit a few times in Leviticus. And that's what we say in our prayers, by the way. What's the point of Yom Kippur, this whole elaborate ritual? And the vidui of, of Ni'ila is basically about this idea. Why should you die? Repent. Atone for what you've done. That is, uh, I think, a, a, a deeply profound idea. Now we have to ask this question. One of the Rabbanim in the Gush, I found, he put all, all this online and similar ideas. I went looking for it after I was discussing with the guys on Shabbos, so I went looking for stuff. Thank you, Harav Google. And he was wondering, you know, all these other aspects, we found it, it explicit that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Cain, and Hevel all brought sacrifice. Where does it say that Adam brought sacrifice? Because I'll also talk about how Adam was created. It was the same day it was created. It was a long Friday. Basically, Adam was created Friday afternoon, shortly before Shabbos. And like, one hour, the first hour, this hour he was created, I think it was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And at the fourth hour, that's when he got his wife and even had children. And then he sinned, he ate from the tree, and then he stood in judgment. And he left God, you know, with bedimus, it says, which means he had been convicted, but his sentence was commuted. And then he was allowed to stay in, in the Garden of Eden and enjoy Shabbos. So Adam basically, like, right, right after he was created and all these things happened, Shabbos hit. So obviously he didn't bring a korban then. Eventually he made his way to, to, uh, to Jerusalem and offered sacrifice. So it says when he was created, he offered sacrifice. It obviously wasn't right away because he was basically placed in the Garden of Eden right at the beginning, and that's when everything happened. And where's the Garden of Eden? According to the Pesach, it's somewhere well to the east in Aden. Rambam says Aden's a real place, by the way. It's on the map somewhere. I don't know where exactly it is, but it's not, it's not Eretz Yisrael. It's certainly not Jerusalem. Okay. Well, yeah, it's very not like the Rambam to say. When Rambam says all over across Mor Nevuchim that the stories of concerning, you know, everything before Noah, especially what happened in the Garden of Eden and the snake and everything like that, it's allegorical and deeper meaning uh, stuff. It's interesting. The Rambam says Bagan Eden's a real place. Yeah. So there's nine that the Hidekel and, and the Proth don't really start. The Euphrates and, and the and the Tigris River don't really start the same place. You know, they both start basically somewhere in, in Turkey, in eastern in eastern Turkey, and they they variously uh, identified the other rivers. Uh, one is the Nile, right? And yeah, and it's not it's not connected. So the, it, it, obviously it's not talking literally. The point is they knew that the Garden of Eden was a source of blessing, and it's somewhere well to the east. When Chazal talk about it's in the east, it's not Eretz Israel. Elsewhere in in Sefer Brishas, the east is basically you know Bavel, Haras and Madai, places like that. So, so he says that it's a, it's a physical place. Yes, the Rambam says, says the description of the physical place is not all the stories are, are allegorical, and, and yet the Gan Eden yeah. it is, is allegorical. Yeah, sort of. But the fact is, is that there is a nice, really nice place in Aden, which the people you know, say like this is the nicest place on earth. He says it's a true place. He says it very explicitly, Gan Eden's a real place. Okay, but the point is. You're not going to be able to find it right now, and there's a magical tree of life and tree of knowledge there that you, from which you can eat and something, you know, and you'll be punished from. That's not how it works. Either way, the Rambam says this, and the question we have is, so obviously Adam eventually made his way to Jerusalem shortly thereafter and offered the sacrifice according to this tradition the Rambam saying. So the question they had is, where is this, uh, where is the allusion, allusion with an A, in say for Bracious to this? So I'll show you something. To basically, it's a combination of two psukim. One of the classic Rashi's you read at the beginning, you understand that Rashi's telling you conceptually what is the purpose of man. 
it says here in the second chapter that God had created this, the world, but something was wrong. It wasn't working. You know, the, the bushes haven't, have, hadn't sprouted. They had been created, but it's like, it's not growing right. The grass ain't growing. It hadn't rained yet. It takes the first rain to get the first grass to grow. And there's no man to work the ground. Let me ask you a question. I understand, yes, you need rain in order to get the plants to grow. Is the Pasuk telling you, this is Rashi's Kasha, the Pasuk is saying that there was basically no plant life on earth until it rained, fine, and until there was a man to work the earth? I'm pretty certain that if there were no humans on this earth, the plants would have a pretty, would be doing quite well. Yes, the animals would take over, cities would turn to rubble, you know, like in apocalyptic movies. The plants would be doing just fine, okay? So why is it that the Torah is saying here that, you know, the basic plants couldn't grow because there's no man to work the earth? Now, I can understand why in order to grow, let's say, proper grain, like crops, you know, make a whole field just grain without weeds growing in it, without something else, you need people. You need people to farm. But grain also grows wildly. Fruit trees grow wild. You could find this. I've, you know, a lot of the world is still wilderness, and it's pretty green. So what does it mean that they needed a, that this hadn't happened because... No man was there to work the earth. So what does he say? What does Rashi bring in the name of Chazal? It's an interesting one. Do you have a Chumash here? You can see. I don't have the, the parish there. He basically says you need a man to what? He said about this, um, prayer. Yes, prayer. La avod, avuda is prayer. What do you call it? Say Hashem lo'kinu ba'am b'cha Yisrael u'fiyotam. Ha'shevet avuda. So it's talking man was there to pray. To worship, basically. Or better yet, not, not to pray, but to worship. Man was there to worship God, and that would call, that would get, bring the blessing to the earth. It then says uh, man, about man's expulsion. You ever wonder? This is back to the Hebrew grammar here. What is it between gerush and shiluach? They're in the same mishkal. Gerush and shiluach are used, by the way, last week's parsha or this week's parsha. They're both uh, they're synonyms for divorce. A so man is megaresh. Okay, they called Gerushin Chazal. Says Vishilach Vishilcha Mi Betho. He sends her out of his house. And similarly, both verbs are used with regards to the Exodus. Shalach Ami Avduni. That's the imperative form of Shiluach. Okay, Vayhi Bishalach Paro Etham. When Pharaoh sent them out. Okay, that ver that verb in various forms occurs throughout Exodus. But in other words, is the Gimel Reish Shin verb Ki Gorushu Mi Mitzrayim. They were sent out from Egypt. They were chased out of Egypt, correct? Divorce this Amma and take out her son also. These words are used almost interchangeably, sometimes in the same verse, just like Ba'avur and Lama'an. Ba'avur zotem aticha, ba'avur harodachad kochi, ulma'an saper shemi b'chol haaretz. That's what God said. I did it to you, Pharaoh, ba'avur, ba'avur, and lama'an. Uncle translates them all as bedil. Okay, so these are two synonyms. The difference is very fine. Gerushin has to be without strings attached. Goodbye. That's Gerush. Garesh. Amazot. Out of here. Okay? Okay? Kala. Garesh. God said after this uh, this this coming plague, Kala. Garesh. It's going to be done. Lishaleach is slightly different. Pharaoh had to do Shiluach. His people did, did Gerushin, but Pharaoh himself did Shiluach. Why? Because Moses told Pharaoh, verse I really like. Moses told Pharaoh, you don't understand. You have to let us go for your own sake. This is for your benefit. You know why? You also have to give us some animals to make on your behalf. Moses prayed on Pharaoh's behalf. How many times in Exodus? On his behalf. Ha-tiru. Okay? Moses prayed on Pharaoh's behalf to stop the plague after it started. How many times did that happen? It happened with, with, the, with the Arbe. And happened with the Barad, right? And what did Pharaoh say after he finally sent them out? This is the best one. Uve rachtem gamoti. Can you daven for me? So Pharaoh did what this, it's not explicit, but Moses had said in God's name, you will give us korbanot. And what happened? That's what Pharaoh did. He gave them. His people sent them out. Here, take money. Pharaoh's saying, you're my shaliach to perform this sacrificial service. So that's why it says Pharaoh sent them out. 
the shaleach, don't forget, shaluach involves also what's the what's the other noun that comes out of the word the shaleach? Shaliach, which is an emissary. So they were they were sort of Moses was fair with Shaliach in a certain sense. So when it says that what Pharaoh did to the people with Moses was a Shiluach. But what the Egyptians did to the Israelites is Gerushim, Ki Gerushim in Mitzrayim. So that's between Shiluach and Gerushim. One more time, Shiluach is string attached. There's still a connection. You can go, but you know you should just know where you're coming from. Okay, there's a cord still attached, whereas Gerushim is complete disconnection. Now we can get into here. This is a very strange verse over here. It says that Adam was Why Yishalahehu Hashem Elokimi Gan Eden. God sent him out of Gan Eden. The next verse says, Why Adam? And he chased out man. Quite redundant. First time he shalayacht him, and second time he gorished him. What's the difference? The second verse says that God basically set up the angels to stop him from ever coming back. He set up his angels with the flaming, you know, what is it, the sword. They're wielding the flaming sword. Man ain't coming back here. Get out. And, you know, he could, he's risk, risking his life if he tries to get back in there. He didn't get back in there. Because God said, he shouldn't get back in here. I don't want him to eat of the tree of life. But before that, it says, What does it say? What was the purpose there? To work the earth from which he had been taken. Wait a second. To work the earth, we know that man was taken out of the earth. It says he was made out of Adama, is the feminine form of the word Adam. He's just the masculine of Adama. What is Asher Lukach Misham? It means he had to go back to work the earth from the specific place from which he was taken. Asher Lukach Misham. The, he had to go back to the very spot of earth from which he was created. God sent them out there. And to do what? To work the earth there. God basically gave him this, put something in Adam's mind, go back to that very spot where you created, because you remember it, Adam was created, he woke up, he's sitting on Harabais, and God sort of, you know, picked him up and put him, you know, brought him thousands of miles away to, to this paradise, and then kicked him out of the paradise, he made his way back to his creation place, and he's supposed to lavoda tadama there, he has to work the earth there. So what did we say earlier, what does working the earth mean? Exactly, it means worship. So when he was sent out of Gan Eden, he was sent to worship at the spot from which he was created. That's what this verse means, if you put it all together. So that's how the sages knew that Adam, when he was created, offered sacrifice to God. And where? At the Temple Mount. Okay? And it's really clear. Like I said, obviously not on the first day of his creation, not on the second. First day was Friday. Second day was Shabbos. And he was only kicked out Motzei Shabbos. Well, I've been Motzei Shabbos. God showed him the fire. He didn't kick him out, I don't think, at night. It was on Sunday morning he was kicked out, basically. Okay. Perhaps, yeah, I don't want to take these stories overly literally, especially in Midrashim. You can't take them overly literally, but that's what the sages are trying to teach us. That's how the sages understood the lesson, that Adam, shortly after his creation, went to offer sacrifice at the spot of the Mizbeach. And that's why it's very important the Mizbeach be there, because really Adam should have been put back in the ground. He had sinned, so God told him, Afar ata vel afar tashuv, go back to that dust. You're made of dust, you should go back to dust. But the tikkun that Adam discovered was that if he offers sacrifice, he could postpone the deen and he can atone for what he's done. I think it worked quite well. He ended up living another 930 years. Okay, according to our records, he was only he only was only beaten by like three or four of his own descendants. Okay, no, Jared, Methuselah, Noah. I think there's another one who lived more than 930. Okay. There's, there, there, the, okay, no, no, not, yeah, Methuselah, Jared, 962, I think that's him. There's one that's just short of Methuselah. 962. Yeah, who's the 969? No, I thought it was 97. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, okay. I'll have to look it up. I think you're right. Methuselah's the longest, and then there's, I think, Jared, and Noah is 950, like we just said before. So, uh, yeah, so Adam did quite well, and it worked. Let's get to where we were now. We were, we were looking at... Let's turn the page. I'll do this for the benefit of everybody else there. I, I think that this is going to make a good Yom Kippur sermon, understanding why this is the value. And by the way, and then we have to cry about this, is also very touching. Is this a Ne'ilad Russia or a Musaf Russia? So it tells you like the, the, the value of do it before you're dead. But remember, the atonement is achieved. What did God teach man? go to the site of the temple and offer offer sacrifice mm. you know so rabbi salvechik uh 
wrote about how he used to listen. He remembers uh, Rav Chaim davening on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, and they got to Seder Avoda. He's like he joy. He was actually like he was standing there in the base of Mikdash. Then he got to the Putim afterwards, like that Titin Achris the Amecha part, and you could just feel like the tragedy of the you know the, the Hurban in his voice, like he shuddered and cried, you know. So it's uh, it is um. Oh, yeah, it's pretty bad, you know? Don't, you know. You don't know what you're missing. If you don't study these things, you don't know, you don't understand that it's not right, you know? Most people understand the whole idea of right and wrong, by the way. There's rights. There's what you have. There's, you know, things you could do. But there's certain things that are just not right. You know, there's there, there's place. You know, there's a time and place for everything. And place is a very important, important aspect of our whole worship. You know, Adam has his place. The Kwanam have their place. The Levim have their place. And, uh, yeah. Can you imagine what it's like not having your place? That's what it's like. The, the, the Rambam says the, the Gullus basically was the biggest uh, cause of the fact that there's no, no, nevia, uh, no Nevuah among Am Yisrael, Right? It's like the, the, the pain of the Gullus and all those things make it basically impossible. The Rambam's saying now, I think the Rambam was thinking about himself. People like the Rambam, I think maybe he was thinking about his father, couldn't possibly achieve the level of a Navi because they're just not in, you know, everything was so bad for them. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.